This one is a bit of an emotionally heavy one, but a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant episode. We're learning more about the HIV virus and what it does to the body, and also the world's sort of response to people with HIV at the time, the amount of stigma and kind of the lack of humanity shown to people with it. Let's crack on. Donald Bassett. I thought this might be your sort of place. No, I'm just having a drink before I go back to the wine. Whoa, that's quite a bit of acting. <laughs> but no, I'm not convinced. Well, I got that part in Tim this week, which means you didn't. I know. You stole my life. If anybody's interested, and you should be, I've done an interview speaking to Nathaniel Hall, who's the actor that plays Donald, which is the love interest of Richie there in that scene. Nathaniel's personal story of acquiring HIV the first time he had sex when he was 16 uh, is, is quite a powerful thing as it relates to this show. We spoke a lot about the stigma to do with HIV, the power of advocacy. Am I dying? I can't answer that, darling, but have you been to a doctor? I can't. I really can't. I've had the same doctor all my life, ever since I was a kid. He knows my mum and dad. I can't tell him this. No, it's okay. We've got numbers of clinics. You don't have to use your real name. No one needs to know who you are, but they can help. Jill is the real definition of an ally. She's now working for a helpline. How sad is it, though, that people couldn't even trust their doctor, not only to support them, but also to maintain confidentiality and not disclose it to the rest of the family? He said I can have a set of keys so I can get in at 8.30 before him. I'll open up for the day. So what's that promotion? Did you get my money? Are you like a manager now? No. So what does it mean? It means I can open up at 8.30. <laughs> oh my God, Gladys, your life is too exciting. You are killing me. <laughs> I've had sex with a millionaire, but you've gone and beaten me. <laughs> you've gone and you're hilarious. Yeah, proud of my keys. I remember Gladys Pugh once had a cup of tea and it didn't have any milk in it. It's so thrilling. Like being on a roller coaster. <laughs> I was in that position once. I worked in retail when I was like 19 or 20. And I remember being so happy that it was like, oh, we trust you to go and open up the shop. It means you have to get there, you know, 15, 20 minutes early. You can get paid for that. Don't know why I did it. Free labor, that's what it was. Young and naive. This is what I like to see. Everything up and running. Come on in. I'll have a cup of tea if you don't mind. Thank you, Colin. Well, it's colder than I thought. Said on the news last night, 14 degrees. I can't be right. It was more like nine or ten. Is it collapsed? Oh no, he's having a seizure. When somebody presents with their first seizure as an adult, it's really important that we scan their brain because what we're looking for is potential signs of infection or some sort of lesion like a cancer in the brain, anything that can be irritating the brain in order to set off all the electrical discharges that happen that cause a seizure. The doctor said you can have a fit just once and that's it. Like a storm, it comes and goes. She said they don't really understand it. But you can have one fit and never have another one ever again. What causes it though? There's no epilepsy in the family. I'll ask you not to Jean, but I don't think there was any on your dad's side. Not that I know. Sometimes that does happen, but it's really important that we do rule out all the triggers for it first. So that would be doing blood tests to check there's no salt imbalances that could be triggering it. But most importantly, scan the brain. The CT scanner was first created, I believe, in the 60s. First commercially available one was then in the 70s. So now we're here in the 80s. They should definitely have one available. I think he was embarrassed because you wet yourself on the carpet. Okay, Mum. And that kind of stain takes a bit of cleaning, let me tell you. Okay. The smell of Adam piss can linger. Okay, thanks. I love Colin's mum already. I adore her. Incontinence is common in a seizure. It's actually one of those things that can help distinguish what is a proper generalised seizure versus other causes of a collapse with some slight sort of tremors and, and quick movements because there's lots of different things that can cause that similar presentation. Given the context of this show, the worry is... Has Colin got HIV and has his immune system been suppressed enough for there to be an infection in his brain that's causing irritation and causing these seizures? We know that people with a very suppressed and weakened immune system from things like HIV are much more at risk of a particular type of parasitic infection in the brain called toxoplasmosis, but they're also at increased risk of a type of cancer in the brain called lymphoma. Whoa, whoa. He's only 16 and he's just seen his mum and dad shot dead. Whoa. That's a Kaposi sarcoma. Too, so he just stands there, but they've still got his sister. Those that watched my reaction to episode one will already be familiar with this type of skin lesion called a Kaposi sarcoma. This is a type of cancer and it's caused by a virus called the human herpes virus number eight, HHV8. Only tends to cause this type of cancer once the immune system is very suppressed and very weakened. They're a nice little gang, your mates. I like them. They're nice. Isn't they funny? A bit different, aren't they? 
I was thinking uh, the queer little lot, I suppose. What's that? Women. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, I think that's yeah. nice. Oh, have you tried? Yeah. Well, what happened? Colin's mum everybody the mum everybody wishes they had pretty much all the other characters in the show so far have been rejected and isolated from their original families and had to find a new sense of community and so far Colin is the only one who here has a mum that clearly knows he's gay and just wants him to know that he's loved all the same you shouldn't go to France it's a waste of time yeah, huh? who's going to France? there is no person in France what? am I following? It's France, which I said was stupid because there's no person, but you keep insisting. So I'm telling you once and for all, there's no point, okay? He's confused. Yeah. Think we can get you checked out tomorrow? Yeah. So Colin's confused. I can't help but wonder, as a psychiatrist, if he might also be experiencing some psychotic symptoms as well. Has he been hearing voices? or feeling that something's been interfering with his thoughts in some way, that to him makes that seem like a really logical answer and logical flow of conversation. It might just mean an increase in dosage. So what does it feel like? Does it make you confused? Uh, I don't know. It's like I'm having two thoughts at once. It all comes in a rush and I get a bit panicky. Mm. Oh, he's hallucinating. There it goes. What does? Do you see it? There it goes again. What are you looking at? Do you see? The light. Oh my God! It's okay, I've got you, Colin. I've got you. I've got you. So there's a psychotic element to his presentation, but that also could be what's called an aura that leads on to a seizure. So a lot of people with things like epilepsy, for example, will tell you that they, they can tell a seizure is about to happen. A bit like people can tell if a migraine is going to happen. And then after a seizure happens, there's usually what we call a post-ictal period where people can remain quite remarkably confused and disorientated for at least sort of 30 minutes, an hour or so after the seizure happens. We can attack the symptoms, but the cause is incurable. I have to ask, do you know what that cause is? No. I'm afraid the infection exists because your son has AIDS. Evidently, he's had this um, HTLV3 or HIV. But do you understand? Has Colin said anything? Have you heard of AIDS? From the moment I saw Colin and heard him speak, I knew, I knew that boy was going to break our hearts. AIDS is associated with the homosexual male population. But is Colin going to be all right? I did say it's incurable. What does that mean? Good lesson in terms of breaking bad news here. Stop fanning around and dancing around the subject. Use very simple and very clear language. I've heard too many cases of people talking about a mass or a lump when they're trying to break news that somebody has cancer or talking about somebody passing on or passing away instead of using the term dying or dead. The people giving that news think they're being more gentle and more empathetic, but actually what you're doing is creating more ambiguity and more chance that you're going to be misunderstood. Breaking bad news is one of the toughest bits of the job, but it's so important that the language is clear and understood. They locked him in. You're not allowed out. But I need the toilet. There's a commode over there. But why can't I get out? Sadly, this is based on a real case. It did happen. Thankfully, only to one person, as far as I'm aware. But it did happen. People understood so little about the virus and the way that it spreads that they locked this person away for fear that they might pass it on to other people in the community. It's completely disgraceful and illegal. Your son is infectious. So we've been granted a court order for his detention under the Public Health Act of 1984. No one is allowed in, and he's certainly not allowed out. You mean he's under arrest? It's important to say that none of this is our fault. AIDS is transmitted by sex with men. If he chose to be part of that cesspit, well, who am I to judge? 
You just did. And despite using fancy terms like court order, that's not legal because HIV doesn't spread in a way that makes it transmittable just by being in close proximity to another person. So that's an abuse of a piece of legislation that's there for another reason. This is people projecting their own fear. On to Colin. Well, he's got epilepsy. That was official. They just got it wrong. Colin can't have AIDS. He's never had it off with anyone. Don't be stupid. Of course he has. He's never said. Well, when did you actually talk to him instead of taking the piss? Oh, you're just as bad. Yeah, well, he did talk about some boy. Never said who, like, years ago before he moved in. That's about 20 quid. I've got 200 in the bank. What for? I don't know. Lawyers? Anything. We've got to get him out. His mum says she's got savings, but I don't think it's much. Go, Jill. Goes back to what we talked about in the last episode. A lot of people in this era had closeted sex lives. There was so much judgment around and so much fear that people kept it to themselves. We're here to help. We just want to help. We can help. Because this disease is terrifying. No wonder you're scared. It frightens me to death. But we've got guidelines. We can help your staff, I promise you. So we could go to court, all guns blazing. We could just step back together. We could pause and step back and think and put Colin first. Excellently done, because what you've done is you've addressed the elephant in the room, which is the fear and the fear of uncertainty. Acknowledge that. Share the uncertainty together. The more avoidance there is, the more you end up sort of projecting it and it bouncing around in between you in unhealthy ways. Mom. Look at you, little chicken. Oh, come here, darling. There we are. They wouldn't let me out. I was stuck. Where have you been? I've been trying. They said you'd gone to Japan. Did they? Who said that? I don't know. There was a little man. You're going to get a tiny bit confused every now and then, Colin. But we'll do all we can. Again, psychotic symptoms. There's probably an element of visual and auditory hallucinations that are going on there. You can see he's muddled. You can see he's disorientated. But you can also see a mum that just wants to wrap him up and hug him. If we compare that to the ending of the last episode, and if you haven't watched it by now, then why are you watching episode three? Go back and watch that one. So can't at me and comment on me for spoilers. We saw a family burn all the belongings and all the memories of Gloria after they died. And we contrast this with Colin's mum, who straight away just wants to wrap him up and give him a hug and tell him that he's loved. Yes, Colin's mum. We love Colin's mum. We're going to get you moved back to London. They've got experts, sort this lot. And you'll be close to your friends. I can stay around the corner. In fairness, the specialists in London probably do know more. I do get confused. Why is that? It's because of your illness. It turns out it's a little bit more than epilepsy. Dr Williams is here because he um, wants to be in the room when he tells you. Why? What is it? He tells me what? What's wrong with me? Oh, Colin, you're breaking my heart. Sorry. You don't have to be sorry. I'm not dirty. No one said you were. I never did anything bad. I really didn't. Can they make me better? You're moving back to London. I know a bit more there. Well, they haven't got a cure, have they? Have they? I don't know. They're trying. I'm not dirty. Just sit with that for a moment. A young lad who's just been told he's going to die, his immediate response is to apologise to his mum. And to say, I'm not dirty. The world really was vile to people with HIV at this time. They really were vile. Does everyone die? Of AIDS? We don't know. Does every single person die? Yeah, they do. I read your stuff. That's what it says. It says no one survives. Oh, mommy, make them do something. I don't want to die. I don't know what to say. Um, I don't know about you, but in the space of only two and a bit episodes, I've connected with Colin as a character so, so much that, oh, this is making me so sad. 
thing about AIDS, all your defences get lowered. So when people say coughs and colds can kill you, that's because ordinary illnesses run out of control. They go mad because they can't be stopped. And that's inside his brain? Yeah. And once the brain's in trouble, everything goes. But what is it? I think it's this virus called JC. Oh, the JC virus. Okay. So the JC virus stands for the John Cunningham virus. We, we call it JC virus. He's the bloke who discovered it. It causes a condition that's called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy or PML. It only causes this if people have a profoundly suppressed immune system. So we only see it in people with HIV whose CD4 count is really, really low. We can also see it in people that have had organ transplants that are on really powerful immunosuppressants to stop their body from rejecting the new organ. It causes a similar process and a problem in the brain to MS or multiple sclerosis in that what it does is it strips what's called the myelin around the neurons. It strips the insulating wires really around the neurons in the brain that mean the electrical signals that are our brain's way of communicating with different regions of the brain and with other areas of the body as well can't transmit anywhere near as efficiently. Essentially it causes the brain to start degenerating. The difference with the JC virus and PML compared to MS it does so very very quickly. And the more immunosuppressed that you are, the quicker it progresses. He's going senile, like old people. And he's only 24. 24. With PML, my understanding is, is that it actually tends to affect three particular lobes of the brain most commonly, though actually it can affect anywhere. So it can affect the frontal lobe, which is responsible for decision making, but also where our personality lies. So when that goes wrong, you get big personality changes. People become much, much more impulsive. They don't act very socially appropriate because they're quite disinhibited and they find things like judgment and planning and attention to be very difficult. The frontal lobe is also where the motor cortex is. That controls our movement, whereas the parietal lobe has our sensory cortices in, so it integrates all of our senses that we might experience and then there's the occipital lobe which is mainly about vision that might be again why he's been seeing things going up and down so you become much much more weak much more clumsy much less coordinated and then you can get some really drastic personality changes god this is weird richie's being nice to me <laughs> am i that bad boy cheeky i really must be dying i'm glad i don't oh he's dead with me care today did they say we had a meeting of the pink palace we said we can't have your mum paying the rent and we refuse to move anyone else in. Never. But Ash can pay a bit more, and Jill, and I'll get myself some bar work, so your bed's still there for when you come home. I do miss you. We miss you. We really do, every day. Even though you never said a word, we miss you not saying it. I miss you hopping out of the shower in the morning, because I always thought you looked so sexy. So remember when I was talking about disinhibition and acting maybe not completely in a socially appropriate way? I can't see Colin saying that when he was well. That's the frontal lobe being affected. Yeah. You remember. Yeah, he remembers everything, don't you? I think he does. He just stays into space. Let's give him a rest, shall we? Time you two went home and got some sleep. All right, Colin. We'll see you tomorrow. Night, darling. So Colin's awake and he's conscious, but he's not responding to anything in his environment. He may not be aware of what's happening in his environment. If you lose the ability to move your arms and your legs, what you worry about next is you start losing the ability to breathe. Remember, the signal to breathe all starts in the brain and it can only do it by using muscles. You need a certain amount of strength and communication from the brain to the muscles like the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles in order to be able to breathe. It's not going to be good news, is it? Hello. Hi. Hi there. I'm sorry, darling. He's gone. Okay. Oh, bless him. I'm so sorry. He's gone. <laughs> Oh, Colin, you heartbreaker. An incredibly realistic depiction of what this process is like, though. Have we got a Richard Tozer? Let's leave him without his results.
the power of avoidance. That balance between is ignorance bliss if it's a situation that you can't cure and you can't treat and you can't control versus, you know, the knowledge is power thing that we spoke about earlier. This whole thing just brings home the idea of what life would have been like if I had just been born 20 years earlier.